forecasting your day. This is Dubai Eye Weather in association with Air Arabia. Well, it's heating up to 24 degrees in Dubai and Abu Dhabi today. We'll see similar conditions in Sharjah before cooling down to 13 overnight. And if you're boarding an Air Arabia flight to Odessa in Ukraine, expect some rain with an afternoon high of just 5. Fly more with two flights a week to Odessa. Air Arabia. Pay less. Fly more. From Leo Tolstoy to Mark Twain, this is Talking of Books in association with Emirates Airline Festival of Literature 2012. Only on Dubai I 103.8. Uh, so the full title of the book is The Beginning of Infinity, Explanations That Transform the World. And it's by um, um, David Deutsch, who is a, a quantum computing physicist at, at Oxford. Um, and he's a sort of science philosopher in the mold of Alan Turing, Richard Feynman, or uh, Karl Popper. And the book is essentially, in my opinion, one of the most uh, bold, provocative, mind-expanding and life-changing books that I've read. Essentially, it's an intellectual exploration of things like art artificial intelligence, creativity, beauty, free will, and the future of humanity. And not to forget the concept of infinity as well. And um, it's a book about ideas. It's a book about optimism, scientific this importance of the scientific method and um, um, the, the values of the 18th century age of enlightenment. Uh, well, broadly speaking, it has three threads of thought running through the book. The first is the idea of the jump to universality. Uh, what that means is um, knowledge is unbounded and human progress can be infinite. Uh, the second thread is uh, epistemology, the, uh, the, the, the study of knowledge and how we decide whether something is true or, or not. And finally, liberalism. Uh, the most important thing to preserve is the ability for cultures and societies to correct errors in their knowledge. Mm -hmm. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, it certainly is. Uh, did, 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 um, you, did you have to study it as part of your coursework or no, voluntary well, uh, like Mr. Roberts said, it was a very, it's a very influential book, and it kind of inspired us to have many of our events, like TEDx. At, at our school, we, had, we were really proactive, so we hosted a lot of events that were inspired by this book, such as the TEDx, our TEDx event, or the Intelligent Optimism uh, Movement, and so forth. So we decided to finally, once and for all, read this book, because Mr. Roberts was just going on about it, and it <laughs> seemed like a very fascinating book, and it was, really. I mean, from the moment you put it down, and whilst you're reading it, your perspective completely changes, because David Deutsch has this very optimistic approach, you know. It, it's one of those rare books that gets you excited about the future, excited about being a human being. Wow. You really want to Seriously, I mean, I think especially uh, oh, the youth should read it because uh, all the ideas that he presents kind of gets you to want to achieve more as human beings, you know, that we are capable of so much infinite progress. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very inspiring. It is, definitely. definitely. Yeah. It puts into perspective um, what, uh, what um, science really is and the difference between good explanations and bad explanations. Mm -hmm. So you're really um, pushed to seeing everything from a new critical point of view, which is what the pro um, infinite progress requires. And uh, I, uh, are your studies centered on science? Is that how you came to...? Kind of. For us to, yeah. I mean, we also take literature and some humanity subjects, but for personally for both of us, science is our main passion <laughs> yeah passion yeah. but I think anyone could enjoy this book I don't think you'd have to necessarily because this is something that 
affects us all and everyone can connect to, obviously. And like it's in the title, Explanations That trans Transform the World, it definitely is because it, it completely changes your perspective on um, how you view everything, how you view um, the history, our history, our personal history, and how you view the progress of the future. Mm -hmm. It, that kind of ties in a little bit with what Yvette was uh, saying earlier about one of the guests coming to the Lit Fest who, who writes um, the uh, Horrible Science series <laughs> to try to encourage mm -hmm. more girls uh, to be, well, more young people to be interested in science and not see it as a, as a nerdy pursuit. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you, you kind of embody the, the type of people that that writer is trying to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's <coughs> commended <coughs> on, on, on choosing a book because my first thought well, of a young reader's book, this is a bit daunting, I would say, even for adults. <laughs> 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 David Deutsch is tackling pretty heavy themes mm -hmm. on from quantum physics to um, uh, Turing mathematics and yeah. um, the, the origins of knowledge. If you fed random numbers into a computer, would yeah. eventually figure out, uh, make sense out of them. Yeah, one of the things he, he, he points out in the book is that we now have all the tools we need to generate infinite knowledge. So he calls that chapter the jump to universality. And uh, some of the examples he gives uh, include, uh, say, uh, the alphabet as opposed to pictograms. So hieroglyphics, symbols, and pictograms have an inherent limit uh, to how much information you can encode in them. But once you invent the alphabet, you can literally invent and create infinite words and nuances of words associated with any given language. So the alphabet was one jump to universality. The second was uh, the invention of uh, numerals. So using the Indo-Arabic numeral system, you could literally count to infinity, which was the opposite of the Roman numeral system, which had an inherent limit. The Roman numerals had the myriad, which was 10,000. And using the myriad, there was a limit to how much you could count. But with the uh, inc inclusion of zero, you could now have negative numbers, real numbers, natural numbers, fractions, decimals, and you could count to infinity. So, uh, And of course, now that we, we reduce it all to binary anyway. Exactly. Quant uh, uh, computing, binary computing is another jump to universality because now you can encode all information, everything, in the form of zeros and ones. Yes, exactly. Zero and one, and that's it. And I don't know that at the, um, uh, you know, when I was a lot younger and UK went decimal, that Arthur Clarke, of all people, saying, hey, you might think it's an advance to go decimal. You should really be thinking of going octal. Mm -hmm. and oh, back yeah. back then, computers were still, and I'm talking about the, the late 60s, early 70s, that computers uh, were now we, we so familiar with 340K and why of 8-bit uh, and 16-bit. But then it was, uh, why, what's octal all about? <laughs> yeah. and, and it now strikes me, I've just been reading it again recently, that's on, on Arthur Clarke's writing from that time, uh, just how... He Spot was on. He was. He, he was that, that prescient. He, we, we he, are in octal, and we don't we don't realize that we don't think in octal. Yeah. But uh, you're sitting here with um, tablet computers, laptops. I've got the screen in front of me. <laughs> it's all it's all octal based. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, Arthur C. Clarke was prescient in many ways. He he foretold the invention of satellites and uh, uh, and a lot of space technology and exploration of different planets. So uh, he had this uncanny ability to make uh, predictions about uh, about the future. Well, you think future that, technology was, at that least. was 40 years ago. Yeah, exactly. More than 40 years yeah. ago. And um, so when computers were things that you seldom ever saw. I mean, yeah. And they were the size of a house uh, <laughs> and probably had, had um, less computational power than you have in your pocket telephone. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Ray Kurzweil, who, is, uh, uh, who Bill Gates calls one of the best predictors of future technology, he makes this point in his book, the, uh, the Singularity is Near. He says, the smartphone you hold in your hand is now a million times smaller, a million times cheaper, and a thousand times more powerful than the supercomputers that the Pentagon had, which was the size of a building and cost fifty million dollars. That's like a billion-fold increase in price performance the, and the, the, miniaturization. The computers that, that drove the Apollo mission to put exactly. the for moon landings. Yeah. So if we now look at probably um, 
the the old Zinkler Zinkler ZX <laughs> of, <laughs> of uh, thirty years yeah. ago on, on the way out had uh, as as much power exactly uh, th- and remember Bill Gates famously going on record and say that six six forty k rams yeah. got to be enough <laughs> for <everyone. Yeah. laughs> I mean, on the way here, we were talking about floppy disks. Yeah, how they've become obsolete, and it's almost, um, it's really hard to find a way to access that information. Well, floppy, that the, 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 um, the blurring of the distinction between floppy disks and stiffy disks. <laughs> so if you remember, the original floppy disk was a floppy disk yeah. of yeah. about six oh. inches square, <laughs> and it only held, I think, 120 uh, K. And uh, then you got the stiffy that was stiffy and much smaller, yeah. and that, that that held 750. Yeah, and we were so impressed. Oh <laughs> 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 and now we have hard drives that are uh, slightly bigger than your iPhone that store hun- uh, one terabyte. And, and, and even and those the rest. are becoming obsolete. Yeah, I think. Yeah. For you, now that's, now now that's all that cloud computing. And a, a four terabyte that's um, the size of a thumb drive mm-hmm. memory stick. Exactly. Yeah. And we complain so about losing them. <laughs> <laughs> and that all storage is um, in the clouds, and you have sky drives and um, sites like Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah. yeah. It's it's quite accessible and so much more convenient. <laughs> because you can access it from anywhere. You don't have to be carrying around a thumb drive around your neck or around your wrist. And um, you don't have the problem of losing it. The moment you have your login and password, you immediately have access to all these different things that you stored in a different computer or a long time ago. So it's just a good example of how much we've been progressing technology. Well, I, I, I'm so glad that you, 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 you've chosen a book that is challenging. Mm-hmm. As we, we think teenage girls, we, we, we've had vampires and twilight <laughs> and uh, chocolate box girls <laughs> and uh, Hunger Games, <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera, that this uh, our closing hour tends to be, um, we call it for young readers, very often a marked cut-off on, mm-hmm. on uh, and especially with, um, uh, well, I think last week with uh, Scarlett, as always an exception, uh, yeah. that uh, she's not your typical 12-year-old. No, no, she isn't. Well, these, these aren't your typical <laughs> sixth formers. <laughs> um, <Well>, clearly. At, <laughs> <laughs> at, at our recent TEDx event, Raya spoke about what if we could upload our consciousness into computers and create infinite minds. Uh, Edlene spoke about what if our reality is a computer simulation. So they're really into their science. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, again, it overlaps, as, as Yvette was saying in the, in the previous hour, and having horrible science as a theme at, at LitFest. It, it's fun and it, it's stimulating, yeah. but that again takes us to a break. But stay with us and we'll be back in this fascinating book by David Deutsch. Ventacular Sun and Sand Sports part sale now on. Get up to 40, <coughs> 50, <coughs> all right, up to 65% off. Nike, Timberland, the North Face, Columbia, and more at the region's biggest sports retailer. Visit sunandsandsports.com for details. Last week on The Business Breakfast. The business, Jihad L8, is the owner of Manushi. Why did you think that we needed a branded Lebanese flatbread restaurant? Dubai has everything. If you do things right, you can shine. And this is what you have learned from Dubai. Dubai, everything is done at a different level of skills. And we decided to do it better than anyone else. Everyone who's doing our business is doing it based on a franchisable business. We decide to create a homegrown brand to succeed in what we're doing. In every 100 meters, you can find a Lebanese restaurant. But there's no specialized Manaish place the way we are doing it in a very modernized way. No proper street food is done the way we are doing it. The banter. One pound fish, a gentleman called Muhammad Shahir Nazir, he actually topped the Christmas charts. He was a fish trader Whereabouts? in East London at a market and they said, would you please do something to bring the customers in? So he made a bit of a rap song and it hit the, the charts and he's now looking at an entire new career in the music industry. One of the big record companies has given him a deal. We'll get it for you. You'll be singing it before the day's out. It's 2013 and I've got one old wish, which is for a jolly good wife on a one pound fish. <laughs> <laughs> and coming up on Sunday. We'll be looking in greater detail at a potential dampener on the property market here. The decision to cap expatriate mortgages at 60% for the first house and 50% for the second. We're talking to Craig Plum, head of research at Jones Lang Lassar. The UAE's most popular morning show, The Business Breakfast, featuring Malcolm Taylor and Brandy Scott. Weekday mornings from 6 with Al Rastamani Exchange and Do. 
From Jane Austen to George Orwell, this is Talking of Books in association with Emirates Airline Festival of Literature 2012, only on Dubai Eye 103.8. And welcome back to Talking of Books, and we're discussing a splendid choice of um, Book of the Week for our young, but not quite so young, certainly <laughs> not young in intellect readers, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. Deutsch. And um, Rohan, at the break, you were explaining how, how the Enlightenment uh, had stim maybe we need to explain to yeah. the listeners. Do you think we need to explain what the Enlightenment is all about? It, 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 it might be. It was it was <coughs> a movement in the uh, that started in the 18th century, and it was a period that saw some wonderful philosophers like Spinoza and Voltaire, uh, some brilliant statesmen like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, and great scientists uh, Galileo and Newton, and it was a period that valued. Uh, Science. It looked at science not just as a body of knowledge, but as a way of explaining the world and as a way of correcting errors in our knowledge. So uh, what made the um, uh, 18th century um, um, Age of Enlightenment so important was it questioned authority. It questioned tradition. It, it forced people to think for themselves and, and find explanations based on objective external realities rather than on personal subjective experiences. Yeah, before that, it was always about um, observing um, phenomena and trying to understand what it is from that instead of conjecturing and finding out. Um, because knowledge is, you have, it has to be created. You have to look for something that you don't know yet to explain what's going on. And so, um, like he c uh, constantly re reiterates in the book, um, we're looking for good explanations and not good observations. Um, and... Um, things like quantum theory where you need to conjecture because it's not um, it's completely different from classical physics and so um, that is the future of knowledge and that's why we can create infinite knowledge yeah I think he brings it up quite a lot he talks about how knowledge is not only infinite but kind of unpredictable you can't predict what the knowledge of tomorrow will bring at least to some extent but it's a good thing that means it uh, usually he, it connects with how problems are solvable. Just because we don't have the knowledge of it today, just because we don't have a solution for something today, that doesn't mean the knowledge won't be created. So by approaching this whole idea of infinite knowledge, you can well, suddenly course, become optimistic about many things. E even in uh, our going back 40 years to Arthur C. Mm -hmm. Clarke a few years, the, the, the way things have changed. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Chrissy and I's time, we were a wee bit older, our, our parents, and I thought, well, the very fact that we're doing what we're doing now on radio, and there are people listening to yeah. us, unthinkable, that you could be watching a television screen with events happening on the other side of the world, yeah, in real time as it's happening, yeah, would... I but not just to, yeah. to pick up the telephone and talk to exactly. somebody. Exactly, I think other that's another amazing thing about the Enlightenment. I think that was a time where we had the resources to make ideas so accessible to everyone. Because that's something else David Deutsch talks about about how ideas are, are like organisms; they spread from uh, person to person, infecting them, but in a more positive way. And so, yeah, I think that's amazing about our time. We have events like TED that we hosted, and you can actually sp make an impact. You know, a small group of people can actually influence so many others by spreading out their ideas. So that's but amazing. But it, it's also, um, it's rationality. Yeah. If, if yeah. we even go back to Galileo and Copernicus, mm -hmm. that on the, the, what used to be called, what's now used to be called natural sciences, yeah. So examining how the world around you works. And mm. uh, if you challenge the established order of belief, ooh, ooh, well, you, we know what happened to Galileo. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things he points out, uh, David Deutsch, he points out in his book, the, that science has uh, a powerful explanatory, um, I I it's a powerful way of explaining the world. So our intuition for the longest time told us that the earth is flat, mm. but it was through scientific observation and, and through scientific evidence that we proved conclusively that the earth is not flat, it's, it's spherical. And so um, he contrasts um, societies that are based on myths or truths that are based on myth with, with scientific truths. So for example, the Greeks' explanation of the, 
of the seasons was they said well Persephone daughter of Demeter was kidnapped by the lord of the underworld Pluto and so for 6 months of the year she was with Pluto and that's when all the crops died and when she returned to her mother goddess of agriculture uh, all the crops came back to life that's a great explanation it's a great story but it's absolutely not true because it doesn't hold water it doesn't explain why <laughs> Australia uh, or the southern hemisphere ha- has uh, different seasons you know uh, when we're at the height of our summer here in the northern hemisphere australia and new zealand have their winter so the, the, the greeks didn't know that they didn't know that 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 was <laughs> the only truth that they, <coughs> they <coughs> that could <coughs> work for them they they extend to that the world was bored, uh, bounded by the river yeah. oceanos mm-hmm. that we we still have left to us as a ocean but to them that was the river that uh, exactly encircled what they believed was the the known earth yeah and so a science explanation a good scientific explanation is hard to vary so if we said well seasons are actually caused by the tilt of the earth's axis then you can actually explain why the seasons are reversed in the north pole and the, and the south pole or the southern hemisphere and the and northern hemisphere and it has um implications that you could not even predict but it's still possible it's still there even though you don't know it so um the tilt of, of the axis even though you've not been around outside your um northern hemisphere country you can still predict that the rest of the world will have um the complete opposite the um southern hemis- hemisphere yeah. will have the complete opposite of seasons and so it has, that, a, greater have yeah, it it has a greater reach uh, yeah. the coriolis effect on water going down the plug hole northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere the direction in which it, it, it rotates, exactly. it rotates. Does, yes. does it rotate clockwise in the north so reputedly i think it's clockwise in the northern hemisphere but anti clockwise in the southern hemisphere people have been uh, debating this and coming up with I, conflicting yeah. arguments I know I've, so I've heard arguments for both sides I don't know if it's conclusively proven one way or the other uh, No I think it's now sure it's it's totally <laughs> random It <laughs> is random isn't it something, random, isn't something it? Yeah. to do with the pressure of the water yeah. the 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 the, sh- the, yeah. shape, the shape the shape of the yeah the shape of the basin. bottom of the, yeah. the bath or the basin yeah. There's a slight tilt <laughs> or you never know yeah, I, I guess remember some of ones coming up saying, "Well, I was at the equator, or we were there during the war, or something, <laughs> right on the equator, and filled the bath with water and <laughs> drained it to see what would happen." On the assumption <laughs> that you're on the equator, ah, it goes straight, goes straight down. down. <laughs> 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 mm-hmm. Yeah, talking about scientific explanations, I think David Deutsch ta- also talks about some one of the most important aspects of it. That's questioning the current beliefs, yeah. like the Greeks failed to do. He compares the Athenians and the Spartans uh, in a very Im- interesting way, in a platonic, in the form of a platonic dialogue, which is really interesting to read. Yeah. Um, he talks about how the Spartans were not open to suggestions or criticisms, and hence they didn't seek for improvement, and hence never improved, right? Never yeah, the progressed. Their ways were set in stone. Mind. Exactly. Yeah, Whereas the Athenians were constantly debating and trying to improve themselves, and hence they advanced and progressed. So through this, he highlights the importance of questioning when it comes to human progress and moving forward and improving as well. Because, I mean, even th- um, not just through science, but even through art and philosophy, mm-hmm. you can um, stumble upon or conjecture great knowledge um, that you wouldn't uh, possibly happen upon if you were set in stone in your way of thinking. You accepted whatever was there just because it's, uh, it's told to you. And so people um, before Galileo, they're, they're very... Um, Close-minded. <laughs> Close-minded. Okay. They just, they believed whatever was told just because... And they were, not, they they were also gullible that uh, yeah. they, they, they didn't, they hadn't been taught... It wasn't to, available to, to, to them. To, uh, right. to, to, to be, criticize. To be inquisitive. Or exactly. Or, or critical thinking mm-hmm. was, was uh, unheard of. Yeah, it was blind obedience to authority. If y- y- you believe what you were told. <coughs> so if, mm-hmm. the, if the people in an authority tell you the earth is flat, then that's what you believed. Um, but Deutsch, uh, to carry on in, with this thread of thought, Deutsch points out the difference between dynamic societies and static societies is again this inability to innovate. And he gives this wonderful example of the Easter Islanders. Mm-hmm. Now we all know about the Easter Islanders. They, they built these huge statues out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on those islands. And then their society just collapsed and they, they, they've disappeared off the face of the earth in, in terms of, uh, we, in, in terms of uh, how we have very little idea what happened to them after they build these beautiful statues. And Deutsch postulates that one of the reasons their society collapsed was because they 
couldn't innovate. All they could do was create statue after statue that looked absolutely identical. And once they ran out of resources, they they didn't know how to get off the island and society collapsed. Yeah, and, and they were using all their resources to build the statues. So yeah. all, all, all the, their, the, the place was heavily afforested. So they they were used as rollers and scaffolding and so on. Exactly. At, at the expense of other cultivation. Yeah. So more and more statues, but we now Which contribute. <coughs> we we are we are contributing to our own demise. The same process. Yeah. yeah. Co- contrast that with another island society like Britain. Britain is thriving <coughs> because, again, it's a society based on the values of the Age of Enlightenment. It's a dynamic society. It's a society that encourages creativity and innovation, and and free thinking. I think uh, a society that encourages these values May will have been always. At one time. <laughs> 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 if you read J.K. Rowling's uh, casual vacancy. <laughs> well, no, I, I think that the entire education system has now become geared to, oh, showing off for each government. Yeah. People are now getting more degrees. <laughs> there are more and more people getting <laughs> A-levels. But then in but what? They've got a degree degree in rolling plasticine worms. <laughs> <laughs> with honours. Yeah, the fact <laughs> that they're not updating the education system as much anymore yeah, is... It's a it's a, a sign. <laughs> it's a very industrialized system where you move from class to class as the bell rings, and um, you don't. Um, we're not cultivating our students or um, us to think about the future, to criticize, to um, question, to um, be inquisitive people who will look for solutions of the future. Yeah, that because um, I mean, kids in, s- in kindergarten are not in, in being no way prepared for what they will have to encounter thirty years from now which is when they will be out there in the world by themselves. Yeah, that's a really important question. Are, is the education system preparing us students for the beginning of infinity? Well, you, uh, well, uh, you two, are you, are you exceptions? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I, I think if the, if the world is in the hands of people like these two, <laughs> I'd be totally confident. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've been pretty lucky. We've um, Mr. Roberts has opened our eyes to these sort of um, yeah. these books and uh, different branches of um, philosophy, and so we are we are taught to question whatever we read, to um, understand in the mo- at the most basic level what we're. Um, it, that's the taught. thing. At this point, it's mostly a matter of luck, but uh, it's not exactly a part of the education system. Yeah. I mean, nowhere in the school, cu- school curriculum was I told to read this book or even informed of anything, if any of these ideas, not even one that was presented in this book, which isn't a good thing. Because after you read it, you realize how significant they are and how, how much of an impact they can have on our world. And this is the kind of thing we should be reading. Have you ever come across G- Ben Goldacre? No. Bad no. Science? Bad Science, yes. yeah. That's, well, that, that, that's, <coughs> that's probably the next I'd also say book. Yeah. <laughs> mandatory reading. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because there's all so much pseudoscience out <coughs> there, mainly mm. because the general public isn't really educated about science. So a lot of pseudoscience gets the upper hand. And people find it difficult to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. And I blame the school system uh, because science is taught as a body of knowledge. But science is much more than that. Science is a way of looking at the world. And when you look at the world through a scientific literate lens, then the world is a m- much more different place. It's an exhilarating place. Things uh, You seek explanations and you move away from superstitions and primitive fear. Yet people are more than ever, when I see all these really, really crazy body, mind and spirit books yeah. that, that, yeah, that come up to, with such it's monotonous to whole new level. program, from astrology to crystals mm-hmm. to, to, exactly. to whatever woo-woo new age theory <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it is, is the in fad today. To mind, they should just be banned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then if true. you ban something, it makes it more popular. That, that thought that where people educated if properly and had critical thinking, yeah. Yeah. they wouldn't be buying them by, by, ex- by the barrel exactly. as and they do. I can, we can tell you, if you go to McGrudy's or any of the bookstores here, <laughs> their section on astrology and horoscopes it's is massive. Larger, Much yes. larger than section. astronomy or anything. You can barely anything. find any science exactly. books. Yeah, I go to look for science books and I see one shelf of books that I've already seen or I'm not... Um, well, uh, we're finding kindred spirits here, but I think <laughs> it, it is time for a break and we'll be, b- we'll be back on a pet hobby horse in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Yes, that you'll have. This DSF, Damak is back with the best. Buy a luxury hotel apartment and take home an Audi. Guaranteed. Call 04301 or visit damakproperties.com. Damak Properties. Live the luxury. Terms and conditions apply. Dubai Today with Suzanne Radford. 
Discussing the topics you want to hear living in the UAE. People who are cyclothymic might actually be diagnosed wrongly as bipolar. What cyclothymic? It's actually the regular kind of mood disorder. It doesn't even have to be diagnosed. It's, I mean, sometimes people have mood swings. You know, it could mm. be a bad day. It could be because of your own monthly cycle. Mm. Uh, men have 33-day cycles, actually. Women have 28-day cycles. And during the cycle, it could be a cyclothymic phase. And these phases don't necessarily have to require major depression. So whenever we see cyclothymic cases, it's not because they're suffering from a chemical imbalance. It may be situational too. Divide today with Suzanne Radford and you in search of that perfect work life balance. Weekday mornings from 10 a.m. only on Dubai I 103.8. From Leo Tolstoy to Mark Twain, this is Talking of Books in association with Emirates Airline Festival of Literature 2012. Only on Dubai I 103.8. And welcome back to Talking of Books and a very fun, certainly for me, session <laughs> <laughs> with Ad Adelina and Raya on um, education, enlightenment, science, learning, having cr the importance of critical thinking mm -hmm. and how uh, the future of the human race is dependent on this. If, uh, if not, if we all become totally passive and accept what we're told and do what we're told and we're, we're back into the dark ages again. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the main, uh, the main thing of science is that um, except no authority. So um, he constantly talks about, how, um, David Deutsch, he constantly talks about how um, in the olden days we were um, influenced by things like um, authority, the, m the ruling families, or um, because of funding problems they couldn't... Um, they couldn't um, search what like uh, answers, explanations. Look for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, talking about the perspective that science gives you. Uh, right in the first chapter, I think David Dosh talks about that. He talks about the cosmic perspective, which is again really extraordinary because it's just a. It, it, you may science may look like a bunch of facts, but like Mr. Roberts said, that it allows you to see the world from a completely different way. And what he talks about is that he gives this thought experiment of dividing our whole universe into cubes the size of the solar system. And he asks the reader what they think the average solar system would look like. And a lot of people would think it, uh, it would be filled with stars and so on, but no, I mean, the average, so uh, average cube hmm. in a universe would be cold, dark, and empty, completely inhospitable for any sort of life. Yet, regardless of that, we actually exist as human beings. I mean, despite the fact that 96% of the universe is empty, literally empty space, we actually exist. So when you learn these facts, you obviously become more optimistic about our very existence, let, let alone what we're going to do with it. Yeah, so Stephen, Stephen Hawking, uh, he takes issue with something Stephen Hawking says. Uh, Stephen Hawking calls us chemical scum floating on the surface of a typical planet around a typical star. But Deutsch says we are not uh, typical matter in the universe. There is something special about the way the matter has been organized because for the first time information is now being encoded in brains and devices and we are able to transform our, our, our reality. We are able to transform our world. He points out the fact that the topography of the island of Manhattan is now no longer shaped just by forces of geology but by the forces of human culture, economics, human thought. Look at Dubai. 30 years ago it was sand. Now the... Uh, because of the force of human imagination and the power behind it, we are transforming the landscape of our planet. That is extraordinary stuff that our but species is We, we, we also have to maintain it. Yeah, but of there course. There's, Chrissy, you might remember a couple of years ago we had a book of the week on, on this. What would happen if man gave up? <coughs> if we were suddenly wiped, uh, wiped off the face of the earth? How quickly everything would revert. And Manhattan was a case in point. That if it wasn't for the constant pumping of... Um, um, dewatering the place mm. and maintaining electricity that bonk, Manhattan within a month would be back. Buildings would, would disappear that uh, uh, 200 years of development. Yeah. And then in fact the entire world, 200 yeah. years of development would be gone in the space of two, two years and it would be back pretty much the way it was 
before yeah, going on, uh, it's interesting human because intervention. Noish has a chapter on this called sustainability and it's, it's really startling because he talks about how not being sustainable is the way forward because I mean a lot of people are constantly worried about resources and so on but if you come to think of it we have the whole universe at our, uh, at our disposal and I know it sounds outrageous to actually use the rest of the universe to move from earth and colonize space and so on but he also points out that nothing is impossible if it's permitted by the laws of physics and in his chapter he talks about the, in the past uh, the 1990s he attended a lecture where they were talking about how uh, soon there would be a catastrophe because f because of the fact that we don't have enough resources and so on but it never happened not because it, the prediction was wrong but because we created new knowledge Ooh. to solve our problems but th th that that is so repetitive that way back in the times of um, of sailing ships mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, Spanish Armada Trafalgar and so on there was a crisis of, of timber there weren't enough oak trees <laughs> left. Yeah. So, hey, what are we going to do? That, that we're, we're now going to run out of timber to, 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 to make our, our ships. It's like saying today, hey, we're going to run out of diesel as we, have <laughs> we, can't, we can't send the destroyers out to sea. Yeah. But that that but got overtaken. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, our ships are cold, made of metal. Yeah. Cold steam, steam burning engines uh, and very inefficient. The original steam engine was pretty inefficient until the triple expansion boiler came along. Yeah. And that... Um, Paved the way for, for for steam that in turn gave way to 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 um, fossil fuels, and I think we'll we'll, we'll create we'll yeah figure what something out. Well, one of the things he uh, one of the points he makes quite emphatically is that humans survive not because we uh, conserve but because we create and innovate. Yeah. Uh, so conservation is great in the short term, but in the long term, uh, conservation and recycling they're not going to help our species. We need to invent our way out of problems. That sort of ties in with uh, what Peter Diamandis talks about, um, how we, the moment we've ma we make energy abundant, everything else, we've solved all, solved all our problems because we can um, then clean water very easily. It makes it very easy to clean water. We can um, solve the water shor uh, shortages in um, Africa, Africa and the developing countries. Um, that, in turn gives them the chance for education because they're not spending um, three or four hours a day walking towards um, a well to get water and then three hours to walk back. And that um, it builds up so much more, um, uh, it gives us a wider range of innovation because more people are um, joining the, the discourse, the, the worldwide discourse. Like so yeah, they're coming online. They, they all have smartphones now, access to the internet. It's the he rising highlights billion. it a lot in his book. He talks about, yes, prob problems are inevitable. There will always be problems, but they're also solvable. Well, we're, we're, so we're prompting polarized comment from listeners. And one uh, <laughs> in, 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 in the blue corner, uh, not identified, says that the idea of questioning dogma has itself become a dogma that may not be questioned. All skepticism ultimately ends with intellectual relativism and thus nihilism. The Enlightenment was the godmother of both fascism and Stalinism. <laughs> now, don't rise to the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a more interesting one is uh, I'm interested to know what these young ladies are planning for their future, how they decided which university they want to attend mm -hmm. and what they will study. And uh, Mr. Roberts n should get an award for how he's enlightening his class. Well, hey, thank you. We agree. <laughs> That's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what, are you, what are your plans? Well, for I want to study neuroscience, and I definitely want to do stuff like this more. I really want to spend a large chunk of my future career writing and popularizing science as well. So... Yeah. Uh, same here, but more in the field of particle physics because that's it's um, something that we don't know much about, and mm -hmm. it's it's up and coming, and I really want to be a part of that. So you've got no uncertainty about that. Um, yeah, I'm ninety percent no. sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think no, we're that, both doing things. That was that a play on words. <laughs> yeah. On he Heisenberg, if you. Yeah. If you <laughs> uncertainty <laughs> principle. The, obse the, obse the observer will have an effect. <laughs> Adelina, I know you have a, a lot of little stickies in your book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any particular quotes that you wanted to um, read out? Well, not these are not particularly qu quotes. They're more um, interesting ideas that I can develop if I do science writing or um, just want to reread again. Okay. Actually, I have one. I mean, that one that was I found the most inspiring. It's actually not by David Dosh himself, but Isaac Asimov. Um, it's a quote in the beginning of the last chapter, <laughs> and it goes like this. Um, this is Earth, 
not the eternal and only home of mankind, but only a starting point for an infinite adventure. All you need is to make that decision. It's yours to make. So it's just really inspiring. It's, it, only, it not only tells us that the beginning of infinity is possible, but it's our decision. Because there's nothing stopping us from making it happen but ourselves, I think. So, um, yeah. One quote that always sticks with me is, this, um, is one by Sir um, Humphrey Davy where he says nothing is so fatal to the progress of the human mind than to suppose that all, all our views of um, science and nature are ultimate, that there are no mysteries um, to investigate. It, it's not word for word, but that's pretty much what he's saying. And it's so true because um, the moment we stop looking, mm. the curtain falls on humanity, on our um, knowledge, on anything that, any innovation that we were ever destined to have. And it's it it's like the beginning of the reversion back to neanderthal the, the age of the neanderthals but worse because they only they had only just started looking mm. whereas we have stopped and so. uh, just i know i i know you said uh, john uh, we shouldn't rise to the bait but i'd just <laughs> like to very quickly address <laughs> Uh, ad address the first uh, uh, the first caller or the first um, response you got when he said um, skepticism engenders uh, Stalinism and Nazism um, I, that's a long political debate but what uh, skepticism uh, does uh, bring about uh, or highlight the, is the predictive power of science and, and mathematics mm -hmm. those are the true progeny of the values of the 18th century age of enlightenment and uh, maths has real predictive power. So, for example, uh, the neutrino or the Higgs boson or antimatter, these were all first predicted on paper using pure mathematics and then we discovered them in the real world. Mm -hmm. So, um, we shouldn't discount the, 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 the predictive capacity of science and mathematics to explain the world around us. Also, we've been corresponding with David Dosh via email, and after talking to him, he thinks that one of the main things that would stand in the way as a challenge between us and the beginning of infinity is pessimism. You know, we need to believe that, not only believe, but accept the fact that things will get better. Yes, we have a lot of problems and all of that, but we shouldn't be blindly optimistic, but recognize that we have the resources to provide solutions to these problems. In fact, there's a quote uh, where he says that optimism is a way of explaining failure rather than prophesying, prophesying success, which I think is just so true. But maybe we've just got time, we've been so busy talking, oh but yeah. I, I haven't <laughs> thrown in the quiz question here to win a copy of David Deutsch's book, <laughs> The Beginning of Infinity. And he is a professor at one of the famous British universities. Oxford. Mm. Oh, <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> but I was going to give you, it was a multiple choice anyway. Yeah. Is he at Oxford or is he at Oxford. Cambridge? <laughs> so uh, text us on 4001. Is David Deutsch a professor at Oxford <laughs> University or Cambridge? And we, we spoke to Isabel from Cambridge earlier in the programme. Uh -huh. So uh, maybe this is a balancing act. Yeah. <laughs> So, 4001, is it Oxford or Cambridge? <laughs> Not to worry that I, I've done that myself <laughs> often enough in previous weeks of um, giving away the answer to the quiz <laughs> programme. Plenty of times, John. Plenty of times, yes, you, see, you know, only too well. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said, Higgs boson, that um, Professor Higgs was... Got Nobel Prize, I think, this yeah. year for for physics. Has, has he won it? Uh, I haven't. I think it. he's um, nominated. I'm not Certainly sure if he's nominated, won nominated, but yeah. well, well the stock of nominations. He's got he's got to be a front runner. But yeah. it does take us to the break. But stay tuned. We'll be back for the last segment of today's show. This DSF, De Mac is back with the best. Buy a luxury hotel apartment and take home an Audi. Guaranteed. Call 04301999 or visit damacproperties.com. Damac Properties. Live the luxury. Terms and conditions apply. Around town or around the world. When you're on the go, you need to know. The latest news and business stories, sports and lifestyle. All in the palm of your hand. Whether it's an iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android, we have the app for you. Wherever you are in the world, keep Dubai Eye with you. Get your free iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android app at DubaiEye1038.com now. Over the next 60 seconds, this is a glimpse of what Dubai I 103.8 has delivered to you from the world of sports over the last 365 days. 
The Etihad Airways Formula 1 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. A real shame the engine just died. I got to watch the race and it was uh, incredible actually. The Omega Dubai Desert Classic. Rafa Cabrera Bello of Spain has won the Dubai Desert Classic. The Dubai Duty Free Tennis Championship. Championship point here into the body of Murray. High return. It's probably too high. It is too high. The Dubai World Cup. Mikhail does it again. The Pro League. You know, Alain are coming into this season as very much the favourites. They, they've got the best squad. I, I don't think that's a doubt. The beat soccer into Continental Cup. You know, tomorrow I will speak with the Russian coach to pay slowly, slowly, so don't be tired for the semi final. <laughs> In 2013, there is only one station for your sport. Don't miss a moment. Dubai I 103.8. News, talk, sport. From Leo Tolstoy to Mark Twain. This is Talking of Books, in association with Emirates Airline Festival of Literature 2012, only on Dubai Eye 103.8. And welcome back to Talking of Books, and a very, very entertaining discussion mm -hmm. with uh, supposedly our young reader section, but I think <laughs> this, is, this is a book would challenge the minds of readers of all age, ages, so... Thank you to Ryan and Edeline for uh, bringing along the beginning of Infinity, uh, David Deutsch, and to um, teacher Ron Roberts for um, stimulating, and I hope that um, <laughs> Ryan and Edeline are, are just typical of, of um, your entire school, your entire class. They, they're, they're quite extraordinary, actually. Raya is the president of the Astronomy Club, Edeline is the president of the Science Club, and they are sharing their passion and enthusiasm with the rest of the school. You know, there's dozens and dozens of students who uh, take part in these clubs, and, and they also debate, they're expert debaters, they, they won numerous awards uh, in inter-school competitions, so it's, it's fabulous. It's, it's a privilege for me to be uh, their teacher. See the future safe, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, to see that uh, from our point of view, that um, we should worry about children and grandchildren's future. That uh, <laughs> I think will last out another couple of years. Yeah, but I think if the if the future's in the hands of people like these young women, we're we're, we're quite safe as a human race. <laughs> We, we are indeed. Now, no, our listener says, ah, you fell into the trap. Will the rapid advancement of technology end up destroying us? Mm. Uh, oh. Yeah. I think that's what we're well, talking about. Yeah. That. As machines become smarter and thus taking yeah, over, that's actually something will we become slaves to machines? <laughs> <laughs> that's actually something AI. I uh, refer to during my TED Talk in the end. Uh, a lot of people have this misconception, but what they don't realize is that it's not machines versus us. Machines are a part of us. We're with this them. iPad that I have in front of me is literally a part of me. That's where I store my thoughts, and I, it's an extension of me, rather. You know. So if anything, we're going to merge ourselves with the machines rather than rather than them being versus us so really not really no I, I don't think so even um, curiosity the Mars Rover it's um, uh, Jason Silva talks about how it's um, um, an extended phenotype of ourselves we are we are looking at Mars ourselves just through this technology that, that we've created and um, we've not just happened upon it it's knowledge that we've created from our uh, our brains and so we in that like everything else is um an extension like raya said of of us yeah and uh, this dystopian view of the future and of technology it comes from watching too many hollywood <laughs> exactly, movies exactly yeah. i can't <laughs> think of one optimistic hollywood movie which portrays the future in a positive or way or scientifically accurate i think only the jetsons <laughs> which is the cartoon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's all movies like The Terminator where the yeah. machines take over. Well, We're Ar never Ar going Ar to... Arthur C. Clarke and Space Odyssey. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's that one of the rare exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> where, where are we though with, with constants? If we look at... Um, I'll go back first. That one the, 100 years ago, maybe less than 100 years ago, the president of the French Academy of Sciences, uh, this was at the, the early stage of steam engines and the motor car and so on, that if man travelled faster than 30 miles an hour, he would disintegrate. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, he, he was at the forefront of academic knowledge in his time. So we're now bound by EMC equals MC squared, that the, the, the speed of light mm -hmm. is that's it. So no, that interplanetary travel, intergalactic travel, we look at light years, yeah. Yeah. and even the closest, if we go to Alpha Centauri, it's still... It four, <laughs> four light years away. Four light years yeah. away. 
So um, how are we going to overcome it? So is there a way of of beating? Do you think it's possible I that we will, we will overcome? There was a mistaken information that neutrinos were traveling at the speed of light, uh, oh, faster than the speed of light, and we thought that this could be the beginning of um, time travel or sending information back into the past. Yes, that, that was discounted, though. Yeah, yeah. They, they it, it was just it a mistake of the peer LHC, review. the yeah. Large the Hadron Collider. But the, the beauty, again, of, of, of proper science is collaboration Criti and, exactly. and, and critical right. thinking. This one doesn't look like... It was because like of critical thinking and questioning and that we managed to again correct and again. No, please, please check and make sure that... Um, yeah. Remember the cold fusion nonsense about okay. 20 years ago yeah. 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 That, uh, that went unquestioned <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and um, all the laws that we seem to find, mm. they're, not, they're not ultimate. They're not the knowledge and not that's all it. Of them because all, yeah, um, a lot of them are being improved upon all the time. Like new um, Newton improved upon Kepler, Einstein upon yeah, Newton. That's it's that's what makes science so uh, powerful. I think people fail to realize that it's a process. It's not just a bunch of facts. Yeah. By questioning, you're constantly upgrading your, our knowledge, and we're constantly getting more and more accurate. And coming back to the question on how we're going to achieve intergalactic travels and so on, that's the beauty of it. Beauty of, beauty of, beauty of it. We don't know today, but David Deutsch says that knowledge is infinite, and it doesn't know, mean that we won't so know do you think tomorrow. We, we, we yeah. might have Stephen Hawking, I think, talks about possible wormholes mm. that we... Yeah, wormholes. Shortcuts yeah. through, um, Shortcuts through the fabric through. of time, mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, I, when I was emailing um, uh, David Deutsch, um, he, I asked him his views on the Omega Point and whether we would attain all knowledge. And he said that there are some, um, there's some knowledge that it would be immoral to um, create and there's some knowledge that would be insignificant in the larger picture. And it would make no sense to waste our time on that. And so it, it makes sense because this idea of the Omega Point, it seems great that we would know everything that's happening, but would we really want to know everything? Like how many grains of sand are on the planet and how many grains of sand were on the planet 50 years ago? Because some things you just don't want to, don't need to know. And it makes sense. It really does. Well, the uh, immoral, what could possibly be immoral uh, other than you're wasting time <laughs> when you could be <laughs> using your brain to better things than counting the grains of sand? Uh, I, I, I suppose, uh, you know, I've heard this from other scientists as well, but it could be knowledge that could help create a, a super virus that would destroy all yeah. life on Earth. That may be immoral knowledge, maybe, I say a big maybe with an underline. That but obviously has to be explored, but yeah. yeah. But we had, <coughs> that goes back to the geeks, that we, we now call esoterica that literally mean, means behind the veil, esoterikos. Uh, and uh, Pythagoras would hold class in open for, for all and sundry, but the special, you two would definitely have been for behind the veil. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was for the, the, the initiated who would now, Pythagoras would reveal his secrets and hence was known as we now call esoteric knowledge. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> specialized knowledge. Mm. Very specialized, ratified, mm -hmm. arcane knowledge. Mm. <laughs> that, that, that we, we now, presumably what would have been esoteric back then, we look as routine mundane now. Um, I think you told us that, um, Mr. Roberts had told us that before calculus used to be this thing where um, only the highest scientists used to know about it. Now we learn it in um, high, school. high school, in America yeah. it's high school and um, foundation university. So it's it highlights in the progress. Of yeah, knowledge. the progress of knowledge and how um, different things become basic knowledge, and then we move forward from that. It's like a stepping stone. Of course, if, but that the three R's as it used to be. Chrissy and I were young, and <laughs> <laughs> reading, <laughs> writing, and, and, arith and arithmetic. And <laughs> <laughs> once you mastered that, you were done. Off you go and <laughs> face the wall. One yeah. of our um, teachers' TED talks, um, our TEDx talks, um, was about um, how. The three R's have moved on to the six C's. He wanted to make it the seven C's, but that sounded too piratey. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's um, a lot of progress has been made, and I think the next step is to um, revolutionize the educational system, where yeah. Yeah. to make um, to cultivate Upgraded students of of for all. Um, that inquire and are curious, yeah. because that will be the future ultimately. Yes, to to cater for to. Um, Cater for curiosity to, I think, the greatest 
bonus or boon or reason for education is to create a curious mind yeah. mm-hmm. and the quest for more learning. Definitely. Not learn this and learn, to discover if you don't know where to find out and how to find out and to be constantly uh, curious and, yeah. and asking and, yeah. and if I may use it, amazed instead of amazing that we banned the word earlier. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much around us that really is amazing. Yeah. Well, I believe as a teacher, uh, what we need to encourage among our students is curiosity, like you said, but also help them with their research skills and help them distinguish between propaganda, information, misinformation and disinformation. Now that they have access to the Internet at their fingertips, there's a lot of information out there. How do they distinguish between what is true and what is false? And those are the critical thinking skills schools should be helping develop in, in, in young minds. Well, we are just about wrap up time and... Um You'll be out there wondering who are the winners today. So uh, the uh, book of the week, Gone Girl. The question was, what was the name of the girl that was gone that gave a name to the book? Gone Girl. Of course, it was Amy that we repeated dozens of times during that hour. And lots of people got it right, obviously. But the uh, lucky listener whose name came out of the electronic hat, Diane, you've won a copy of Gone Girl. Uh, Ron, sort of. Gave away <laughs> <laughs> which university Sorry. David Deutsch goes to. Of course, it was Oxford. Lots got that right, and Sajid <laughs> Ali Khan's name came out. So, uh, from a very, very entertaining hour, thank you, Rohan, and thank you, Raya. And uh, thank you, John. It was a pleasure. So Great here. being here. For the first hour, Alice Johnson, Yvette, in the second hour with. Um, children's books coming up at the Lit Fest and Kissy, great job as co-host Stephen, we didn't get, <laughs> give you much opportunity to get a word in the past <laughs> hour I was fascinated John <laughs> So we'll be back again <laughs> uh, same time, remember 11 o'clock an hour earlier than before but 11 o'clock next week for more Talking of Books The UAE's only award winning talk radio station This is Dubai Eye News with Do. Experience super fast. Real home broadband with 100 megabits per second.